Hi, very good morning. I am Dr. Janak Patel, MD General Physician. Today we'll be discussing on one of the interesting topic that is thrombosis and thromboembolism. You know very well this is quite common. You will see good number of time this group of disorders in your everyday practice. Now you know very well thrombosis is a formation of a solid mass in a circulation from a blood constituents that is blood components and that formation of a thrombus is called thrombosis and what is thrombus it is a blood clot which is attached to either an arterial wall or a venous wall or endocardial lining of heart most common in ventricle in post mi and in left atrium or right atrium in case of a huge dilatation of right atrium or left atrium so that we call as a cardiac thrombus we use two common words mural thrombus and atrial thrombus while which is attached to the arterial wall or to the venous wall in venous wall we call as a deep vein thrombosis and in arterial wall we call arterial thrombosis so attachment of a thrombus to an arterial wall or to the venous wall or ventricular cavity or an atrial cavity that is the site where you get thrombosis and thrombosis is a process in which you get a formation of a thrombus from blood components so thrombosis is referred to a coagulation of a blood that is blood clot formation inside the blood vessel that is artery vein or a heart in short there are some terminology which are very commonly utilized one depending upon the site that is arterial venous and mural thrombus depending upon the etiology depending upon the components and then symptoms complicated uncomplicated depending upon the components it is called red thrombi which is very frequently in a venous side and white thrombi which is very common on a arterial side there are some particular another words there are a lot of words as we come across mural thrombus infected thrombus classically in case of bacterial endocarditis which will take place in case of a ventricular cavity over the valves and variceous thrombus which is classical in case of a lip band sac endocarditis in sle so these are some of the terminology which are being utilized morphological classification wise pale thrombus red thrombus and mixed thrombus and then there is another word utilized is fibrin thrombus pale thrombus is very common in an artery which is alternating layer of a platelet and it is a initial stage in a venous thrombus red thrombus is seen in a venous side which is platelet layer overlapped by rbc that's why it appears red mixed thrombus is very frequently a middle part of the venous thrombus and very classically seen in case of a ball wall thrombus in a atrium that is mixed thrombus consisting of multiple different layers and fibrin thrombus is very commonly in a dic particularly in a micro circulatory areas where there is lot of fibrin material there's a little difference between arterial thrombus and venous thrombus arterial thrombus is seen in an artery and heart while venous thrombus is seen in a vein arterial thrombus can produce aortic occlusion coronary artery occlusion and cerebral blood circulation as well as other systemic occlusion 
while venous thrombus is very commonly seen in a superficial varicose vein or a deep leg veins most common site and then it can extend from that deep venous system into iliacs femoral and iliacs and then into ivc and then it can occlude renal vein etc venous thrombus is very frequently because of venous stasis while arterial thrombus the most common cause is atherosclerosis or vasculitis or traumatic injury like arterial puncture where you get a endothelial injury venous thrombus will very frequently produce occlusion while mural thrombus will not produce occlusion but thrombus in an artery can produce occlusion arterial thrombus is usually described as a white thrombus which is friable and there are line of giant while venous thrombus is usually reddish in color and there are blue with fibrin strands with line of giants arterial thrombus will grow retrograde means towards the heart retrograde growth will be there while venous thrombus will be in the direction of a blood flow means it is towards the heart so it will be towards inferior vena cava or towards the superior vena cava arterial thrombus will be consisting of a mass work of platelet fibrin red cell and degenerating leukocytes while venous thrombus will be mainly rbc with few platelets that's why it appears reddish and it is mainly because of stasis majority of thing we have already discussed same thing is mentioned here at your leisure time you can go through these are the two difference this is arterial this is venous thrombus location direction nature composition sites etc are being mentioned which we already mentioned before so arterial thrombus is usually pale granular there are line of giants and it consists of cell contents is poor while venous it is soft gelatinous deep red and there are high cell content mainly rbc there is one another variety we will describe is antemortem and postmortem antemortem when the person is alive and this is postmortem after the death antemortem is adherent to the wall red in color and there are line of joints present while in postmortem it is not adherent to vessel wall it is usually because of fibrin with red cells and leukocytes the upper layer resembles chicken fat and there are no lines of joints bland and non laminated peculiar these are the difference we have already mentioned but again antemortem means during life the thrombi is usually little firm granular lines of joints are present and it is attached to wall while postmortem it is like cast of vein rubbery gelatinous red color jelly or chicken fat appearance and it is not attached to venous wall this is typical postmortem and this is antemortem antemortem thrombus formation you can see the thrombus is attached to the arterial wall mural thrombus is very frequently following an acute mi quite common or because of damage to the endocardium by catheters etc quite common so that is called mural thrombus you can have a vegetations on the valvular structure in case of rheumatic valvular heart disease in infective endocarditis you can have a thrombus formation because of a infective material non bacterial thromboembolism is very common that will be occurring in good number of conditions and lipman sac endocarditis will be classical in case of sle there are some other terms also being utilized agonal thrombus which is a clot formation 
in the heart during process of dying antimortem thrombus we already mentioned there is one word called as a ball thrombus which is quite common in atrial chamber because of atrial flutter fibrillation along with huge dilatation there is one another word utilized is milk thrombus parietal thrombus fibrin thrombus highline infective primary stratified traumatic etc these are all the different words which are being utilized we are not going into that detail so white thrombus we have told you which is common in artery which is mainly of platelets while red thrombus more common in vein which is consisting of a fibrin with lot of rbc less quantity of platelets it is over the platelet and mixed variety or laminated variety which is quite common seen in certain area particularly in case of what we call as aneurysms etc now if there is a detachment of this thrombus and that detached particle goes and blocks the distal vessel we call as embolism so detached intravascular may be solid may be liquid or may be gas or may be mass or may be even epithelial cells or foreign material etc can give rise to embolism so it is carried to a distant site from point of origin and it will move in the direction of a blood flow so in case of a artery it will move away from the heart in case of a venous it will move towards the heart and we know very well the etiology for thrombus formation we call wirchhoff strat which will be common for both artery as well as vein and also for cardiac chambers because of endothelial injury or because of hypercoagulability or because of abnormal blood flow or we call stasis so this three mechanism holds true for all the three sites which are the three most common sites for thrombus formation like arterial venous or cardiac we already mentioned all this in a previous lecture that is hypercoagulate stage is very common with malignancy pregnancy peripartum period estrogen therapy or we call oral contraceptive pills traumatic injury or trauma surgery particularly on hip bones abdomen pelvis etc ibd nephrotic syndrome sepsis thrombophilia quite common while stasis will be very common which can produce thrombus in at at atrial chamber because of atrial fibrillation big dilatation of ra or la left ventricular dysfunction immobility paraplegia even severe hemiplegia venous insufficiency varicose vein venous obstruction from tumor obesity or pregnancy this we call as a stasis all this conditions immobility venous insufficiency venous obstruction will give rise to venous thrombosis while atrial flutter fibrillation big la big ra left ventricular dysfunction will give rise to cardiac thrombosis while vascular injury can be common in both traumatic injury or surgery which produces trauma to the vessel wall veni puncture will produce venous thrombus formation chemical irritations while giving iv fluids iv injections etc heart valve replacement or valvular heart disease will give rise to cardiac or valvular involvement and one of the classical example is infective endocarditis atherosclerosis will produce damage to the arterial endothelial lining producing arterial thrombus formation in dwelling catheters very commonly particularly in a venous side can produce venous thrombosis like central venous lines central venous catheters catheter for tpn etc and also because of pacemaker wires catheter wires then icd wires etc that can also produce venous thrombosis during 
ABG collection, it can produce damage to the arterial wall and can produce arterial thrombus formation. So endothelial injury very frequently, classical atherosclerosis will be involving artery. Acute MI will involve ventricular endothelial linings. Rheumatic and valvular heart disease will involve cardiac chambers and valvular structures and other condition which can also produce damage to the endothelium like hypertension, endotoxins, scarred walls, hyperhomocysteinemia, hypercholesterolemia, smoking, radiation, etc. can also produce damage to endothelium. Venipuncture like IV injections, IV fluids, venography, pulmonary angiography because you always approach to a venous system, right heart catheterization, tips usually approach through, through what we call as a jugular vein. Then central venous pressure lines, TPN or we call hyperalimentation, this will produce thrombosis in a venous site. While arterial puncture like ABG, intra-arterial cath, particularly for coronary angiography, which are usually by and large left side catheters, or left heart catheterization, coronary angiography, CABG, etc. can produce thrombus in a arterial site. These are all the risk factors we have done before in, while doing atherosclerotic chapter. We have non-modifiable causes and modifiable causes. These are the causes responsible for atherosclerosis, which will be mainly in artery and involving a major blood vessels or we call big size blood vessels and middle size blood vessels. Small size are not commonly involved, but you get involvement of certain blood vessels like retinal, peripheral nerves, kidney, etc., coronary artery, etc. We call microvascular and macrovascular involvement. Because of alteration in the blood flow, if there is a turbulence, it will very frequently produce arterial thrombus. Classical example in case of a left atrial hypertrophy with atrial flutter fibrillation or right atrial hypertrophy with atrial flutter fibrillation. While venous stasis will produce venous thrombus. Classical example varicose vein and venous insufficiency. Arterial example we have already given atherosclerotic obstruction, coarctation, aneurysm, TAO, Takayusu, vasculitis, etc. Well in venous mainly because of immobilization and chronic venous insufficiency. In a heart we have already mentioned huge left atrium with atrial flutter fibrillation. Then there are certain factors which are very commonly responsible for hypercoagulation like factor 5 Laden mutations, prothrombin mutation, antithrombin 3 deficiency, protein C and protein S deficiency. These are all genetic or we call primary. While in acquired, mainly because of immobilization, very frequently venous embolization, myocardial infarction will produce mural, surgery, fractures, burns, etc. can produce uh, damage to endothelium, malignancy, valvular heart disease will produce very frequently again damage to endothelium. DIC, SLE, secondary SLE will be because of vasculitis and increased coagulability. DIC will give rise to trigger of the coagulation. A person on hormone replacement therapy or oral contraceptive pills are more prone for hypercoagulation, smoking, sickle cell anemia, in nephrotic syndrome because of increased level of cholesterol or we call hypercholesterolemia, all this can trigger of hypercoagulability. There is one more condition in a blood like polycythemia rubra vera because of increased RBC mass, chances of stasis, sluggish blood flow and can trigger of thrombus formation. Even in secondary polycythemia also because of increased RBC mass, it can predispose. In case of sepsis, because of toxins, it can trigger the thrombus formation. Even in a snake bite, 
snake venom can also trigger off. In case of platelet disorders, thrombocythemia, or we call thrombophilia, and polycythemia rubra vera, because of abnormal platelet count, you can have increased chances of thrombus formation. These are all the other causes which are inherited causes and these are acquired causes of thrombophilia which can give rise to thrombus formation. If you are interested at your leisure time, you can go through. There are other risk factors which can also be responsible for thrombus formation like stroke where there will be more chance of immobility in heart failure because of stasis, obesity, trauma. Dehydration will increase pack cell volume, increasing the chance of thrombus formation, arrhythmia, particularly atrial flood of fibrillation, acute respiratory failure, severe vasoconstriction during postpartum period, malignancy, etc., becomes a risk factor for increased thrombosis. Once there is a thrombus formation, secondary due to injury to the blood vessels or damage to endothelial lining, stasis of blood, agglutination of RBC, toxic thrombosis or abnormal platelets, etc. Any one of these conditions we have already mentioned before, because of stasis or because of imbalance, stasis can be there on an arterial side or on the venous side. I am not going into tremendous detail or because of imbalance between what we call as the material which activates clotting and material which inhibits the clotting. If there is an imbalance, then also there will be. Means if there is a substance which activates the clotting factor are increased and inhibitors are decreased, you will have a chance of clot formation. So coagulation will take place and if there is increased action. You will have a fibrinolysis and that will give rise to bleeding, which will happen in case of classical example is DIC, where both factors are activated. This is how in atherosclerosis, because of endothelial injury, increased vascular permeability, platelet activations, release of factors, T cells accumulation and atheroma formation. And once there is an atheroma formation, now it gives rise to endothelial damage and then it will allow the platelet to get attracted and attached to the damaged endothelial or we call exposed collagen tissue. This is one slide, this is one slide at your leisure time you can go through. What happens? Simple way it is being explained. As soon as you get a vessel injury, first you get a vasoconstriction followed by damage area, there will be attraction of platelet. Platelet will release platelet factors, which will give rise to formation of a secondary platelet plaque. And then there will be formation of a thrombus or we call as a formation of a clot because of activation of coagulative caskets. This is how the thrombus forms. This is in atherosclerosis, initial stage, you have got a fatty streak, then plaque formation, Stable plaque, which will give rise to some of the symptoms like angina, claudication, etc. Unstable plaque, rupture, thrombus formation, occlusion will give rise to unstable angina or acute MI. Together, we call it acute coronary syndrome, may even end into coronary death. And when it involves cerebral blood vessel strokes, and when it involves peripheral artery, it can give rise to critical leg ischemia. Now, this thrombus can get completely open up because of thrombolysis, which is by what we call as fibrinolytic activity, which is present naturally in a vascular system or can get recanalized and partial blood flow will resume back or from a thrombus formation, you can get a dislodgement and gives rise to what is being described as thromboembolism. And when it gets completely occluded, it will give rise to infarction because there will be no blood supply, ischemia, 
complete lack of oxygen and nutritional supply leading to death of a tissue we call as infarction from mural thrombus it can get dislodged giving rise to thromboembolism and that embolism will block a tiny blood vessels leading to in that area infarction or you can get vegetations on a valvular structures this will be very good number of time infected material and that will get dislodged it will produce infarction and because it is a infected material it will give rise to local abscess formation so this will be what will be happening in case of a different types of thrombus this will be because of activation of a plasmin and that will give rise to natural lysis and complete vessel can open up so there are certain things which will happen complete occlusion or it can resolve completely you can get a thromboembolism leading to pulmonary embolism because thrombus from a venous system will travel all along the vein into ra rv pulmonary artery and lung leading to pulmonary embolism it can get organized partial or complete organization or it can get propagated and it is always towards the heart that is from deep vein towards femoral common iliacs and then ivc so you can have a propagation you can have a thromboembolism you can have dissolution because of increased fibrinolytic activity or it can get organized and recanalize and in a late stage you can have a calcifications so propagations resolutions organizations recanalization incorporation and embolism all this process is a outcome of thrombus formation so you can have a lysis and resolution you can have organization with a scar tissue formation you can have a partial opening of the canal we call recanalization or dislodgement of the thrombus leading to thromboembolism and it can propagate further to a proximal vessels in case of a venous while in case of an artery it will be retrograde so you can get occlusion of venous side like deep vein thrombosis bercheri syndrome portal vein thrombosis renal vein thrombosis cerebral sinus or we call superior sagittal sinus most commonly jugular vein involvement cavernous sinus etc this will be intracranial this will be abdominal this will be all abdominal no once again on this slide the three now, common sites in this particular thing you can see from a venous chambers. side it can enter involve popliteal femoral common iliacs and if the thrombus get dislodged embolism and that will go towards right atrium right ventricle and pulmonary if there is an thrombus formation in a right atrial chamber secondary due to atrial fibrillation and enlargement of the right atrium it will directly enter into rv and pulmonary artery giving rise to pulmonary infarct and pulmonary embolism will can be a massive saddle variety also while in case of a la like left atrial enlargement atrial flutter fibrillation you will have a la thrombus dislodgement and it will go into systemic circulation and mural thrombus secondary to myocardial damage can give rise to what we call as systemic embolization which will be non infective but if there is an involvement of a valvular structure and it is infective we call in infective endocarditis which is a infected material that can also dislodge and enter into systemic circulation so once it enters into systemic circulation this is called cardiac embolization and if it is because of atherosclerosis in the distal vessels or aortic arch of aorta etc that is called arterial embolization and that can be from different areas like carotid artery mural thrombus from ventricle this will be mural thrombus 
this is mural thrombus this is mural thrombus this is from endocarditis this is from myocardial infarction this is from atrial flutter fibrillation this is usually from what we call as a endocarditis involving aortic valve you can have from descending aorta aneurysm or atherosclerosis in descending aorta then aneurysm in iliac arteries or popliteal arteries etc that will give rise to thrombus formation in this area all this can be and consequences of embolization there will be decreased blood flow in the distal part and you will have ischemia and infarction depending upon the size of the artery if there is a gradual occlusion there will be development of the collateral blood vessels which will produce less damage and it will depend upon the size of the artery you can have different varieties of embolization like venous embolization ending into pulmonary artery arterial embolization can involve any blood vessel supplying any particular structure in the body you can have a paradoxical embolization if the person has got asd vsd or pda with reversal in that case you can have a paradoxical embolization that is a venous embolism which comes to the ra or rv which will enter into left side because of reversal very rarely you have got an embolism in a left side that is la and lv which enters into right side and can produce a paradoxical embolization that is rare fat embolization is quite common in a person who are undergoing surgery on a liver or breast tissue or a obese person with abdominal surgery etc amniotic fluid embolization is quite common in a peripartum period air embolization can take place if a proper precaution is not taken and in some good person particularly if you are doing a surgery on neck or you are doing a surgery on the lung etc also you can have an air embolization in case of a tension pneumothorax septic embolization will be quite common classical example is in a case of tuberculosis leading to miliary tuberculosis and in case of a infective endocarditis leading to septic embolization and foreign body will be good number of time in case of what we call as a surgery post surgical or while doing some procedure the tip of the catheter can be broken and you can get a foreign body embolization clinical picture will depend upon good number of factors one of the factor will be type of embolization site of embolization and size of the vessel in small vessel embolization good number of time it may be asymptomatic almost all symptoms are because of occlusion of the blood vessel whether it is venous or arterial and commonly the symptoms can be because of initial thrombus formation followed by an embolism so will depend upon the vascular system which is being involved acute or gradual if it is gradual usually there are collateral so it will produce less number of symptoms an organ how fast there is ischemia that will also determines the clinical symptoms and signs so this is a difference between the two types arterial and venous we have already discussed in an artery usually i am just going through the major that is in an artery it is always sudden in onset while in a venous it is usually slow in onset in artery it will usually give rise to systemic involvement of an artery and producing infarction while in a venous it will involve pulmonary artery producing pulmonary embolism and pulmonary infarctus so artery can involve coronary carotid femorals many and that will usually give rise to what we call as an acute mi in case of coronary in carotid cerebrovascular and tia and in case of a distal or we call peripheral arteries claudications while in case of venous thrombophlebitis edema painful extremities because of thromboembolism pulmonary embolism so only one organ is involved because of a venous thromboembolism 
So claudication, wrist pain and gangrene will be very commonly in peripheral arterial disease. On venous occlusion, you will have edema, varicose vein, infection, venous ulcer, venous gangrene. We call cerulina donlens or cerulina albans. In a heart wall, mainly ball wall thrombus can produce occlusion at the mitral wall area and leading to acute pulmonary edema. Very frequently because of thrombosis, depending upon the occlusion in subclavian vein, person can have cramping pain, tenderness, swelling, skin over the affected area will be reddish and reddish or blue in color, but it will be warm in the area of clot formation. In arterial systemic embolization will invariably produce arterial gangrene which will be usually dry gangrene. In case of venous thromboembolism it will produce pulmonary embolism and pulmonary infarct. In a right heart embolization pulmonary embolism and pulmonary infarct. In a left heart systemic embolization and leading to gangrene. This is etiopathogenesis in case of arterial thromboembolism. Hello? Ah, bolo. Ah. Na. Ah, one. Ah, karaile. Ani kale mane bata dide je. Ah, okay. So, depending upon the site, usually it will give rise to what we call as a systemic embolization. Most common is mural thrombus is in 80% of the people and left atrial thrombus is in about 25%. Heart wall vegetation producing infective embolization and thromboembolism will be another group. Paradoxical embolization is very, very rare. Maximum amount of embolization is there in a lower extremity involving major blood vessels like iliacs, popliteal, etc. 10% are cerebrovascular stroke and very uncommon in mesenteric artery, renal artery or splenic artery. So, I already told you 80% are intracardiac. From that major 75% to lower extremity, 10% to cerebrovascular strokes and usually very frequently it will produce small blood vessel to uh, depending upon the size of the thrombus. Microemboli will usually involve retinal blood vessels producing retinal damage. You can have all the different organs, cerebrovascular strokes spleen, kidney, small intestine, lower limb, this is maximally involved. So these are some of the structures, brain, kidney, small, uh, small intestine, large bowel and lower limb, most commonly involved. And site can be mural thrombus, left atrial, vegetations from valvular structures or even from aorta that is ascending aorta, arch of aorta, descending aorta, in that also coarctation, aneurysm, atherosclerosis, common, most common. I'm not going into detail regarding the difference between leg ulcer, that is arterial, venous and neuropathic. At your leisure time, you can go through. If it is a bacterial thrombus and they are usually micro, so they block what we call as a vasa vasorum, and that will lead to what is called as a mycotic aneurysms. So very frequently you get mycotic aneurysms. And in case of a retinal blood vessels, we come across what is called as a rot spot. This is one of the diagnostic criteria in case of an infective endocarditis. Very rarely you come across iantrogenic emboli, which is very frequently from latex material or glass sphere or air or fibrin or a broken material from different types of catheters which are very frequently iantrogenic 
and they are usually micro in size, so they block small blood vessels, leading to small artery involvement. Venous thrombus can end up sometime into stroke, MI, limb ischemia, and even a hepatic artery thrombosis, very, very rare. This I've already shown you before, so I don't have to discuss again in detail. In case of pulmonary embolism, it can lead to shortness of breath, chest pain, cough with hemoptysis, tachycardia, and if there is a fall of blood pressure, person can even have a symptom signs of shock, hypotension and shock. While suspecting a pulmonary embolism, always use Wales criteria. It is called two steps Wales criteria. You can utilize that. I've already discussed before. Among investigation, history and physical examination is most important. In arterial thrombosis and thromboembolism, peripheral pulse examination is very important. Doppler and color duplex is very important in case of arterial as well as venous. Arteriography is done to find out the collateral site, size, severity of involvement. And venography is important to find out the site, size, and severity of the venous involvement. Echocardiography is important to find out the cardiac site of thrombus formation and thromboembolism. And then you can go for predisposing factors like coagulative factors, endothelial injury, stasis, etc. Investigation should be done to find out those predisposing factors. This is how you approach in a person whom you suspect pulmonary embolism from DVT, a flow charts, which we have already discussed in a chapter of DVT. You can go through here at leisure time. Some of the laboratory tests like platelet count, bleeding time, clotting time, activated partial prothrombin time, etc. should be utilized to find out the involvement of blood and blood components. Prothrombin time is also useful. INR, fibrin clots, stability, D-dimer studies, etc. is very useful in particularly in case of a DIC. Differential diagnosis, mainly you will have to differentiate arterial, venous and cardiovascular thromboembolism. Complicated, uncomplicated, and where is the involvement and probably you should also try to find out the etiology as far as management is concerned most important part is prevention and prophylaxis which should be done for both arterial as well as venous involvement once there is an occlusion you have to treat for occlusion and if there is a partial occlusion always look for chances of thromboembolism and prevention of that should be done and you should try to find out the basic etiology and treat the basic etiology so that person doesn't get recurrence. And you should have a regular follow-up to find out the prognosis and progress of the disease. So anticoagulation, thrombolysis, surgery, endovascular and antiplatelet agents are the main pillar of the treatment for thrombosis. So thrombolysis, anticoagulation, mainly by heparin, low molecular weight heparin, oral anticoagulants and nowadays we have got newer oral anticoagulants we call NOAC. Prevention is mainly done in case of atherosclerosis by antiplatelets maybe mono or dual antiplatelet therapy. Very rarely you require a replacement of protein C and protein S. Surgical intervention is done by thrombectomy and arterectomy or atherectomy. With involvement of a coronary artery, you can go for angioplasty, balloon dilatation followed by stenting, or you can go for bypass graft. In case of a venous thrombus, prevention of thromboembolism can be done by IVC filters. Very rarely in a severe arterial occlusion, you can go for we call as a bypass, aorto femoral bypass. This is complications which can occur in a venous system we call as a phlegmasia, serulina, dolens, and serulina albans. 
you can have a post thrombotic syndrome you can take preventive measures to prevent a post thrombotic syndromes by anticoagulations and in case of an occlusion you can go for catheter directed thrombolysis also you can combine thrombolysis with thrombectomy it is called pharmaco chem mechanical treatment pharmaco is thrombolysis and removal of a thrombus or an embolus is called pharmaco mechanical or mechanico pharmacological multiple different terms are being utilized this is venous thrombectomy you remove the thrombus from the venous side you can see how big the clot is thrombus yes you should remove that it will result into good recovery complication occlusion ischemia non healing ulcer gangrene most common and thromboembolism involving systemic or pulmonary so complication will depend upon arterial occlusion will produce claudication particularly distal blood vessels claudication raised pain and gangrene venous occlusion will produce edema varicose vein infections venous ulcer skin changes and then gangrene and in case of a mitral valve wall wall thrombus can occlude and produce acute pulmonary edema arterial thromboembolism will usually produce gangrene into systemic side venous thromboembolism will produce pulmonary embolism right heart will produce pulmonary embolism and left heart will produce systemic embolization leading to gangrene so i thank you all for taking out time i know that your time is valuable i appreciate you for spending some of the time with me i hope this lecture will be helpful to you in your practice also very frequently ask in your oral as well as in your theory so i end my lecture here i hope this will be helpful to you see you in next lecture